All right, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and I want to welcome you all to our discussion this evening. We're looking forward to finding out what's going to be happening at the Georgia legislature and all kinds of plans along that line. Before I go any further, though, I want you to know that the opinions expressed on Just Peace do not necessarily reflect those of Radio Free Georgia Broadcasting Foundation Incorporated, its staff or volunteers. And I'm pleased to say I'm here in the studio with co-producer Cliff Albright, and he's going to introduce our guest. Yeah, well, Go ahead, Cliff. Yeah, and just to give a, give a little bit of an overview, we're going to be talking with Lewis Elrod, who's from Better Georgia, which is, a, well, I'll let him tell you about them, but they do an online newsletter and they just kind of keep folks informed of what's going on in the state from a very progressive perspective and so we'll be talking with him about what's been going on so far and what we expect to be going on at the state legislature here and then a little bit later on in the show we're gonna have another guest come in just to give us an update uh, Caroline Stover who's gonna come in and she's with the group that's been organizing the, the weekly protest for the past few weeks at Senator Purdue's office so she'll be joining us a little bit later on probably about quarter two and uh, give us an update on that. But first, we want to um, welcome Lewis. How are you doing, Lewis? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me, Clint. Right. Heather. We're glad you could join us. And, you know, there's been so much going on, obviously, since the, since the election, since the inauguration. So much focus on what's going on at the federal level, and, and, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we've, we've seen all kinds of crazy things going on already. But the, the, the challenge is that there's also a lot of stuff going on at the state level. We've seen... Uh, that you know, and I forget the exact number, but the you know twenty something or of states that are Republican trifectas, where the Republicans control the governor's house and both houses mm -hmm. of the legislature, and and so we're seeing all kinds of policies from reproductive rights to tax on transgender to obviously voting rights being scaled back, um, just just uh, the attacks on labor, and all of this is going on at the state level. So we just wanted to have you here and to be able to talk about um, talk about that in general, you know, this national trend that we're seeing towards these these conservative policies at the state level, but also to kind of drill down and talk specifically about what's going on at the Georgia level. Do you have any thoughts just about that that trend that we're seeing? Oh, sure, absolutely. It's uh, I I think we can all remember about 2006 when uh, when the Democrats took back took back Congress. Um, it was a it was a huge year mm -hmm. for for the, the Democratic Party uh, nationwide. Two years after that, President Obama was elected. It was really a peak peak time for, uh, for the Democratic Party and for progressive politics around the country. Mm -hmm. But then we hit 2010, right. the U.S. Census. Uh, not only was 2010 a, a Republican wave year, mm -hmm. the uh, and was the advent of the Tea Party as well. You also had the U.S. Census, and so after that, you have uh, gerrymandering, redistricting all across the country, mm -hmm. and that allowed states uh, everywhere to uh, to redistrict, to not only win big majorities in, in uh, Congress and state legislatures for conservatives, but uh, to cut their districts in a way that it would be nearly impossible within this decade mm -hmm. to, to take back those chambers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what we, we see now is that all of that mess that's happening at the federal level with Congress, it's all a result of these, legislature, uh, these legislatures uh, across the country being flipped in that trifecta. And when, when you do have, just speaking from, you know, just speaking from, uh, from somebody who's been watching this all those years, when you do have a state like Georgia, where you have complete power in, in one party, uh, in this case, the Republican Party, this is a state that becomes a laboratory mm -hmm. for conservative policies and policies uh, that the Republicans push. Um, I think we all know uh, the organization ALEC mm -hmm. that puts together pieces of legislation um, that uh, many, many of those pieces have shown up in the, the Georgia state legislature. Mm -hmm. what, what we're seeing is after a state like Georgia becomes uh, a trifecta, as, as you put it, you have all of these different, uh, different pieces of legislation that are part of that laboratory mm -hmm. for conservative policies, and unfortunately the, uh, the people of Georgia uh, suffer. Right. All right. So tell us, tell us about Better Georgia. So what your mission, how long has it been around? Sure. So Better Georgia is a Progress Now affiliate. We have several sister organizations uh, around the country. And what we do, our mission is very similar to our sister organizations. We are a progressive advocacy organization. I like to call us the aggressive progressives. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, essentially work very hard to keep elected officials accountable mm -hmm. here in this state. And we do that by connecting uh, everyday Georgians 
with their elected official through social media, through email, through phone calls. Mm -hmm. And we also do um, a, a lot of communication to the media, crafting message, mm -hmm. uh, messages that work for, that are, that are common sense, that are progressive, that work for Georgians. And, and we, we push that. We've been around since uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the sixth year. This is our sixth year in, uh, of existence here in the state. Right. And that's, that's so critically important because, you know, with what we've seen, you know, I think this past election is a perfect example of how critical messaging is. You know, a lot of times <laughs> we think that, you know, we've got the, the truth on our side or we've got the, the policy on our side and that's enough. And what right. we know, is, is that's just not enough. Well, we'll look at hope and change. In right. 2008 and 2012, President Obama put together the single best message progressives had mm -hmm. in decades. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was simple, it was, it was clear, and it made a huge impact. And uh, in elections before President Obama and elections since President Obama, mm -hmm. we've seen us kind of move away from that model. And I come from a campaign background, mm -hmm. and I know that you can have two things on a winning campaign. You can have uh, two things on a winning campaign in order to make sure that, that you, you uh, in, in order to guarantee that you're successful. You can have a great message or you can have um, a great uh, ground game where you're communicating directly with voters uh, or not even necessarily a, a ground game, but a, a direct voter contact campaign where you're connecting directly with voters. But you can't have just one or the other. If you're connecting directly with voters, but you don't have, you're not saying the right thing, mm -hmm. then you might be turning them off. You might not be motivating them to vote. Mm -hmm. But or if you have a great message, but you're not getting it directly to voters, mm -hmm. then uh, then that's a recipe for for a losing campaign. And and uh, I, I think that conservative campaigns have figured that out, mm -hmm. uh, and they've 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 done a really good job of putting together. Um, messages that they know will be effective with their base and then getting their base out. And I think you're absolutely right. We develop a lot of great ideas. Mm -hmm. Progressives develop great ideas, great policies, but we have trouble making, turning that into a compelling message mm -hmm. and then getting that directly to voters. Right. Right, and we just want to remind folks that we will be taking calls this evening. You can give us a call at 404-523-8989. Again, that's 404-523-8989. We're speaking with Lewis Elrod from Better Georgia. So what are some of the, 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 the hot issues right now that we, we need to be watching? Some people may remember the um, campus carry terms of, you know, mm -hmm. access to guns, you know, just being open. A couple of weeks ago, you all reported and several other people reported on the, the proposed legislation regarding covering up campus rapes. So there's a lot, I know there's a lot going on. Talk to, just pick any, any one of those. And sure, sure. Tell us. Well, well we, can, we can chat about those issues uh, directly. Um, campus carry, I mean, that's a, that is a hot button issue. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a surprise that it has come back this year. Mm -hmm. It went through, made it through both uh, legislative chambers last year, and the governor vetoed it. And what was so interesting about that was that the the governor essentially told the legislature, if you put this in front of my desk, this is what I want. I want this concession. Mm -hmm. And they essentially didn't do it. They, they, they called his bluff. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, nope, we're going to give you what we want. They put it in front of his desk, and then he vetoed it. Mm -hmm. But I encourage our listeners to go back and uh, take a look at Governor Deal's veto message. When mm -hmm. he vetoed Campus Carry, uh, he said he, he was very, very clear about his, um, about his opposition to the policy. And I know that he had said previously that he, in general, wasn't, uh, wasn't opposed to the concept of campus carry, but he wanted these specific concessions. His veto message was very was very clear, and it, it really seemed like he was uh, opposing the whole, uh, m very much of the concept. Mm -hmm. and so I encourage people to go back and take a look at his veto message because I can tell you that we're going to be we're going to be reminding the governor mm -hmm. if if campus carry makes it through both chambers again, we're going to mm -hmm. be reminding the governor of what he said last year and uh, hold him to it. Our job is to make sure that. Uh, that we hold our elected officials accountable, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned. And we believe that there are plenty of avenues to making sure that we have a strong, robust state where, uh, where everyone has access, uh, where everyone has opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone has access. And we think a big part of that is through education and health care. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that the, 
there's several other economic policies that are uh, that are debated in the legislature. Uh, Better Georgia does stick mainly to large to issues such as education, mm-hmm. health care, and ethics at mm-hmm. this point. That's not to say that we don't uh, branch out and speak about a few others, but mm-hmm. we think that it is important for uh, Georgians to uh, have access to health care in order to in order to be able to get work to uh, to apply for jobs and to be able to keep your job. And right now we have a we're in a state where we still have hundreds of thousands of people without without access to health care because we did not expand Medicaid mm-hmm. when we had the opportunity to, and that fell on the shoulders of a single person, and his name is Nathan Deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was one one person, one Georgian had the choice mm-hmm. uh, whether to provide access to hundreds of thousands of people in this state. And he said no. He mm-hmm. said it was a cost issue and said that uh, they would tackle it later. And now we've heard a lot about the state legislature trying to, to fix that fix that issue, particularly because not only does it have an effect on on people who are uh, people who are who are without health care at all, but it, it's uh, hurting uh, hospitals. There are several hospitals that have closed because they have so many people who have to go to the ER uh, without insurance. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, the conservative legislature at this point uh, realizes that and they're, they've been working on fixing it, but right now I've heard that they're in a wait-and-see pattern uh, or, or holding pattern while we wait and see what the the new administration in Washington will do with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I would say that is one major item that we've held elected officials accountable on, and we will continue to do so, and and we believe that has uh, quite a bit to do with with being able to maintain. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick question. You're saying that they're wanting to fix it. What does that mean exactly? Do, so, does the as the governor change his mind? He wants to have Medicare expansion. <laughs> well, I, 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 the only thing Medicaid that I can guarantee, uh, the only thing that I can guarantee is that they will not call it Medicaid expansion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. They, uh, the leadership has realizes that the rural hospital crisis is a real crisis, and they've expressed interest in trying to fix it. Uh, Senator Unterman in in the state senate uh, last year also uh, went on record talking about this issue uh, talking about making sure that there was more access to health care for everyday georgians um, but as as we said we hey we can't wait to see what they come up with we hope that it's good but i i can't help but uh, think about the risk that that they took by waiting so long and i don't understand what it could possibly be i mean you so those georgians talking about spending a lot of its own money on the poor to to help expand uh, Medicaid or sure there or what there are know? a few pieces of legislation right now at least one in particular that I believe has to do with credits um, uh, I'm not as well versed on that okay. particular piece of All legislation right. so I would have to refer our readers to uh, to to groups like Georgians for a Healthy Future okay. or the Atlanta Journal Constitution who covers these topics uh, and there'll be more info on that I just want to say that if you'd like to call in and, and join us in this discussion the phone number here, as Cliff had said, of course, is 404-523-8989. Please give us a call. I know the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute does a lot around mm-hmm. around Medicaid expansion as it, well. GBPI is excellent at analyzing the budget mm-hmm. and figuring out where the holes are mm-hmm. and giving advice mm-hmm. to elected officials about what they need to fund next. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You mentioned, you know, it's interesting because earlier when you were talking about campus carry, you mentioned the governor's veto, and it just reminds me of, you know, one of the things while Georgia is, you know, has that that trifecta, you know, one of the things that we do not have is, uh, you know, these the super majorities in the in the um, legislature. You got a lot of states where not just the Republicans control them, but they were controlling by such margins, usually sixty percent or two thirds where they can override a governor's veto um, and, and, and a whole bunch of other things, you know, that they can they can do that requires that high level of, of a higher percentage than just simple majority rule. But Georgia, does, we're not at that level. Not right anymore. Now. Right, not anymore. And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, one seat here and there makes a difference between a veto override, you know, even redistricting. There's some pieces of that that are affected by those super majorities. But, um Another another piece of legislation that was very hot just a few months ago, we talked about it here on this on, on our show a couple of times, was the governor's plan for the, the for the state takeover, the education plan. Oh sure, right, and uh, obviously that failed through a lot of great organizing, a lot of great messaging by folks like you all, you know, by some of the discussions we've had here. But <laughs> we know that 
you know, it's it's not over. And so what's 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 going on with that now? What's the governor's new idea? Where does that stand right now? Sure. This is uh, the governor's new idea is uh, school takeover 2.0. Mm-hmm. And it's important to note that the governor last year pushed this pushed a school takeover plan, put it in front of Georgia voters, all, all Georgia voters, mm-hmm. in a, an incredibly high-profile election, uh, probably presidential year elections are the highest turnout elections mm-hmm. in the state. And the voters rejected that school takeover plan 60-40 mm-hmm. by 20 points. Right. And on Friday, a new plan dropped. It's purely legislation, so it will not be an amendment. It will not go before Georgia voters. Mm-hmm. It will only be in the state legislature. Mm-hmm. And it is really school takeover 2.0. Mm-hmm. It still takes away it takes away power from parents and teachers. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it does not include them on the um, uh, it, it does not give them any authority in uh, in determining uh, uh, what to what to do next and and what what action to take, it still gives gives away power to uh, to unelected uh, officials here in the state. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have been dissecting it over the weekend. I mean, we uh, we took a very good long look at it, and uh, and it's very clear that a few wording changes here or there mm-hmm. is not fooling us. Right. And uh, and and it seems like a a, a pretty um, a, another. You know, misguided attempt by the governor to to try to uh, uh, push the school takeover scheme on on Georgians. Mm-hmm. Cliff, we just need to take a quick break. Sure. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. Sure. And again, we're speaking with Lewis Elrod. He's the political director of Better Georgia, um, an advocacy organization right here in Georgia. And we're talking about some of the hot issues that are being discussed right now at the. Georgia legislature, and we were just before the break, we were talking about governor's school takeover 2.0, and how essentially this time, instead of it being something that folks will get to vote on via referendum, it's just being pushed as a, as a bill that just the, the legislature would, would, would deal with. So, so, so this time around, people won't be able to vote directly on it, so really our, our only recourse at this point is for folks to get in touch with their representatives and, and, and let them know how they feel about it. That's absolutely right. And I would encourage uh, anyone listening to uh, con- to contact their their lawmaker and either their state representative or their state senator and let them know their concerns and ask them uh, if they are if they are supporting it ask them why and make them explain it because uh, not only did 60% of voters uh, reject this amendment. An overwhelming number of state House districts and state Senate districts voted against this as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, if that means that plenty of people, uh, Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter, plenty of lawmakers who may be considering supporting this bill, odds are their constituents voted against an almost identical plan just a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And lawmakers need to be reminded of that. They need to be r- reminded of the fact that this was a failing plan. And by the way, the Amendment 1, last time around, it failed among Republicans, it failed among Democrats, it failed among women, men, any background, any, uh, you know, pretty much uh, uh, statewide, it, it, it failed. So e- equal opportunity failed. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, the and lawmakers need to be reminded of that, and we're going to be working on reminding them. But remember, what we say is not as important as what uh, an, a Georgian says, what a constituent says. Where can we get access to the data, the results of that election? Better yeah. Georgia actually has uh, published a, a lot of the, the data on our, w- on our website, bettergeorgia.org. Uh, we have a blog where we uh, have published a, a lot of our uh, analysis from, uh, from the Amendment 1 campaign last year. Excellent. And this is one of those issues where there's this, this, uh, this intersection between federal policy or potential federal policy and state policy and that we now have a new Secretary of Education uniquely unqualified for the position, but <laughs> we've got a new Secretary of Education who her entire background has been around charter schools and, and, and privatization and, and voucher plans in the state of Michigan. And so you literally have, you know, that from the governor's perspective, you have a friendly ear now at the Department of Education as somebody that would, is, is basically going to let states, at, at a minimum, let states pursue policies like this, but, you know, potentially even provide incentives of some sort for states to pursue, you know, all sorts of policies like this. Well, and I, I think that one of the one of the biggest 
uh, issues with Amendment 1 that we saw last year. And what we see uh, maybe even more so now with this school takeover is uh, essentially uh, the, uh, the, the administration, the, the, uh, governor, the governor's office, mm-hmm. saying that they don't trust uh, parents, they don't trust teachers, and they don't trust local elected officials and mm-hmm. local school boards. Now, I, I certainly understand that sometimes... Sorry, this is democracy, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I understand that sometimes you, your local elected officials, you're not happy with the job they do, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I certainly understand that, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm somebody who believes in elections. Uh, I'm also somebody who believes that when you're doing a, a particularly bad job, uh, sometimes you do need to take steps to make sure that uh, that, that if you have to remove somebody, you have to remove somebody. But mm-hmm. this is this school takeover approach is a, a sweeping indictment of uh, local boards of education and uh, administrators and teachers and parents is essentially saying that the governor's office, the governor's office, doesn't trust uh, local, doesn't trust you with your local affairs. Mm-hmm. doesn't trust you to elect your own leaders. It doesn't trust you to run your own schools. Mm-hmm. They have to do it. Right. And I, I'm just trying to figure out why should we trust Governor Deal? Right. And getting the really insidious part is that lack of trust, which they point to in terms of performance, comes after years of of divesting in education, of the, taking money out of m- education. My favorite argument last year was that the other side continued to talk about how if you were against Amendment 1, that you were in favor of the status quo. And I, I don't know anything more status quo than a state government that consistently underfunds education. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that is the, the root problem here and one that they have not addressed. Well, another hot topic, both last year and I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be coming back this year, the Religious Freedom Bill, um, you know, so-called, <laughs> as Trump so-called, says, so-called, yeah. <laughs> so-called Religious Freedom Bill. Um, which is which is far from being about freedom, right? It's it's, it's really about legalizing discrimination. It, it's, it's a right to discriminate. Exactly, freedom exactly. to discriminate. That that is exactly what it is. And so it passed both houses last year. The governor vetoed it. You know, only based on, you know, seeing the impact that it was having in North Carolina right. and, and the potential economic damage that it could cause right here in, in Georgia. So you know, not so much out of the, the goodness of his heart, but just out of you know, just pure economic common sense. But anyway, it, it, so it, it failed last year. Where are we at this year? Well, uh, Better Georgia's worked to defeat it three times in a row. We've mm-hmm. there have been a lot of amazing groups that have. Uh, put together incredible campaigns against uh, the religious freedom bills. Um, I know that Georgia Equality has been one of the uh, the leading groups fighting uh, fighting RIFRA all these years, um, and I'm sure that they're going to be opposing any legislation like that that comes back. It seems that the leadership and the House and Senate is, is done. They're tired of it, uh, particularly uh, – uh, State House Speaker David Ralston uh, indicated well before session began that he's not going to tolerate any any uh, uh, religious freedom legislation that comes through. We'll we'll see if he sticks to that, and uh, if he doesn't, then uh, then we'll be back we'll be back fighting it along with all those uh, those groups and individuals who have fought hard to uh, d- to defeat it in the past. Okay. I just want everyone to know you are listening to WRFG Atlanta 89.3 FM. The program is Just Peace, and I'm here with co-producer Cliff Albright. My name is Heather Gray, and we have our guest, Lewis, from Better Georgia. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Cliff. All right, and we just want to remind everybody you can give us a call at 404 523-8989. Again, that's 404-523-8989. We're just going through a, a range of issues that are being discussed or will be discussed in the Georgia legislature. Um, we've, we've talked about campus carry. We've talked about health care and Medicaid expansion. we talked about religious freedom. we talked about education, school takeover plans from the governor. We, we had not talked about this earlier, but, you know, obviously there's a lot going on right now in terms of immigration, hmm. you know, questions of sanctuary cities, sanctuary states in some in some cases and then you've got some some states that are going the exact opposite of of <laughs> of being a sanctuary state where they're actually you know kind of at war with with cities within there you know i'm thinking about texas and and uh, i can't remember the name of the county where austin is where that county is trying to be a sanctuary city but texas as a state is against it and so has there been any discussions around that issue going on so well, far I'll, I'll tell you uh, uh two things first mm-hmm. I'll just point out a, 
a, a piece of legislation that's uh, particularly heinous, and then I'll, I'll talk about sanctuary campuses in mm-hmm. just a second. But uh, uh, currently, there's a there's a there was a fairly innocuous bill for, on driver's licenses mm-hmm. uh, that was uh, dropped a, a little while ago um, and introduced. Sorry, I, I don't. I, I I'm only realizing now that the term "dropped" may sound mm-hmm. like it's gone, right, but right, it, right. it it means that it's been introduced, mm-hmm. submitted, uh, and state representative. Uh, Alan Powell from uh, from up where I near where I grew up uh, in Northeast Georgia, who is a uh, conservative lawmaker, uh, a Republican from Hartwell, submitted a, an amendment uh, that passed uh, to this piece of legislation. I believe it was last week to essentially change the designation for non-citizens on driver's licenses from limited term. There's a currently there's a a, a phrase. On the on the driver's license that says limited term, there he wants to change that to non-citizen. He essentially wants to brand a driver's license uh, non-citizen uh, and and brand uh, individuals who are I- here in this country, um, no matter whether they're uh, no matter where their background or their status. He just wants to put non-citizen on the driver's license. Is that the, scar- the scarlet letter? Yeah, um, pretty much. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, so that's that's shocking. It's kind of hard to. To determine what benefit that would that would have when you already have licenses that are that are marked, um, they're just I, I, I don't know. I suppose more subtle, mm. <laughs> not quite as glaring as non-citizen. So, who again wants to do this? Uh, Representative Alan Powell, who uh, I will note was a Democrat for about hmm, twenty-eight years, uh, several, a long time. He was a Democrat for for several years and switched parties after twenty ten. So, uh, mm. he, he was one of the group of uh, party switchers in uh, in the state house. So we're going to be watching that, and uh, I, I assure you that several other groups, uh, several other groups down at the Capitol, uh, I think uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, they're, they're the ones who brought it to our attention, uh, them and uh, the League of Women Voters who were watching it, and they said, look at this, have you seen this? And it's, it's quite shocking. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we're going to be paying attention to that, uh, and I can only imagine that's in response. I, I think it's, it's rhetoric that we're seeing at the national level, and it's emboldening these conservatives. Another piece of legislation concerning this is Representative Earl Earhart's attack on sanctuary campuses, Mm -hmm. essentially telling college campuses uh, or punishing college campuses if they want to become a a sanctuary campus, which Mm -hmm. essentially means that the campus would not would not comply with with the you know authorities who are trying to to seek out undocumented students. Cliff, we do have a caller. Okay, caller, you there? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. I, I wanted to go back to the education matter. Since it was turned down by the voters, do you know who or what uh, entities have brought it back for this uh, legislative session? Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Right. The, it's the governor's office. Mm-hmm. I mean, the governor deal was the pushed the school takeover amendment in the first place. It was one of his signature pieces of legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was his flagship issue Mm -hmm. last year and he was the chief surrogate Mm -hmm. for the school takeover plan uh he would you may have seen him on tv quite often Mm -hmm. promoting the school takeover plan and after his crushing loss at the polls he regrouped reorganized and put this together again so it is it is uh governor deal and um whichever whatever interests are uh supporting that effort we do know that the pro school takeover campaign was funded by a lot of out of state corporations, that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they're back for this one. Right. And then it's just a matter once he puts the plan together, it's just a matter of him finding, you know, the the representative to actually introduce and sponsor and co sponsor. Well, yep, they, he's already got the sponsors right. in. They've already submitted it. Right. So yeah, and and so he's 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 trying to use his uh, his clout to make sure mm-hmm. that it gets through. We just want to thank those who have called in. If you'd like to call someone else please call us. It's 404-523-8989. We look forward to hearing from you. Go ahead, Cliff. You were talking about the sanctuary campus, and, and as you were speaking, it reminded me of something I saw I saw one of those town halls on one of these stations, and the person asking the question was, um, it was, it was very emotional. She would lost a child who had been killed by an undocumented immigrant, but in, in watching it, it became very clear that she, and I'm sure that there's others out there, when they hear sanctuary city what they hear is sanctuary in the sense of go commit a crime go kill somebody come here and you're safe 
<laughs> you know, we won't enforce the law. And that's, that's the way some people interpret sanctuary city. And, and, and I, uh, I, I think that's an unfortunate interpretation mm-hmm. because uh, there, is, there is no protection for someone who commits a violent crime, mm-hmm. who, who commits a, a heinous crime, whether you're a citizen or not. Mm-hmm. The, the law pursues you. This is simply for, you know, I was just having this conversation with somebody today mm-hmm. who was saying, uh, we need to get away from the word illegal mm-hmm. because it makes you sound like it makes it sound like uh, like someone, a person, mm-hmm. is illegal when, in fact, they may merely be undocumented. Maybe uh, the government hasn't caught up with, with them. Maybe it's the responsibility of uh, there are people who are waiting for years mm-hmm. for their chance to, to go in front of a to go in front of a panel, etc. And so, you can't conflate people who are undocumented with people who commit violent crimes and heinous crimes. Mm-hmm. Do we have a caller, Adler? Yes, we do. Call, are you there? Every country has immigration laws, and we need to protect our own people with jobs and services instead of giving this out to other people. There are a lot of people who've committed major crimes that are in the United States, such as assault, pedophilia, uh, weapons charges, and these people give immigration a bad name. We need to be careful about who we let into the country. We need borders. Every country has immigration laws. Thank you for calling. You want to respond? I mean, clear. I mean, yeah. Every country has immigration laws. The question is, you know, what what are those and what are those immigration laws? How do you how do you enforce them? How do you decide them? I think what we're seeing here is, you know, there's a lot of talk about the safety issues and oh, you know, we got to be careful and all that. But what we're seeing isn't, it's, it's not about safety, it's not about crime. You know, many people saw the story about the other night about the woman who's, who's got deported because she had committed a felony. Well, what was her felony? It was the false, I think it was like false ID or, or something like that. That was the felony. And so we're, we're giving the, the we're, there's this perception out there that all Trump, and not just Trump, but, you know, the, the, those within that, that, that school of thought are talking about murderers and rapists, and, and that's not the case. This, it's really a, a war that's being waged about, about immigration in general, even legal immigration, because the, the truth is that's really what the whole, well, a lot of the controversy about the ban was, which was it was targeting people who had even legally immigrated, people with green cards who were being kept from coming in. And so this isn't about safety. It's about, and if you if you look at the teachings of people like Bannon and this crazy man Stephen Miller, who, who did the, the press conference over the weekend, or not the press, but the, did the Sunday shows over the weekend. It's not about safety. It's about an ideology of many in that White House and in, and beyond that White House who want to keep the other out, whether that's the Muslim other. The, the black and brown other, you know, but it's it's not it's this is it's 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 that messaging that we were talking about early where they've they've successfully tried to turn this into a debate about murderers and rapists, but it's really a battle about trying to protect their vision of what America is. I just want to shift the paradigm here for just a moment mm-hmm. and talk about the benefits of immigrants coming to the United States. So my work has been with farmers, black farmers across the South, and I've seen this radical change positive change when a lot of the Mexicans started coming to the United States because, I'm just using this as one example, right, Mm -hmm. that um, they came in and started changing our diet considerably. This provided niche markets for so many farmers, corn for tacos, peppers, and so forth. Plus the fact, I knew a lot of black farmers who were beginning to learn Spanish so they could talk with some of their workers. This is just one example. I also saw a tremendous change, powerful change, when I lived in Australia in the 1970s. Australia was bringing in all kinds of migrants from mostly Eastern um, and Southern Europe, Mm -hmm. but it just just radically changed this closed Australian society. I in fact think that it was the Italians coming in that led to the led to the uh, sizable wine industry in Australia mm-hmm. because the Italians were introducing the Australians who were eating meat, pie, meat pies and potatoes, right, to finally having some fresh vegetables and maybe drinking some wine instead of beer. Anyway, I'm just mentioning that. But mm-hmm. one final thing is that one of the problems that we face as far as the relationship between the United States and Mexico is concerned, one of the first things if Bush wants, well, I don't know why you get, getting confused with these presidents, I don't know. (laughs) 
Trump wants they to do anything, alike. what he needs to do is to stop these huge subsidies to corporate agribusiness because they've been dumping all these huge subsidized crops like corn and so forth on the Mexican market that has absolutely destroyed the agriculture system in Mexico. So that's one of the first things, as far as I'm concerned, that needs to happen in the United States is to stop these huge, huge um, tax, subs tax subsidies to corporate agribusiness. Mm. So, sorry. I, no, I, I think that's an, ap an incredible point and brings up one thought in, in my head, which is that uh, immigration is an incredibly complicated mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And it is not, it cannot be fixed by a wall. I right. mean, any issues that we have, mm -hmm. you, you know, you can't just put up a wall. You can't just shut down legal immigration exactly. and shut down refugees. This is a, a an incredibly complicated issue that uh, the last two administrations, for better or for worse, uh, spent a, a great deal of time working on. And and a lot of it has been worse in, in several ways. But I, I'm fearful of the rhetoric that we see now, that this impression that we can that we can just shut down the borders and kick out anybody who's who's undocumented here that is not realistic mm -hmm. and it is not who we are as a nation we are a compassionate nation and and it's important to to note that we must while we must protect our borders and that's absolutely true we must also in order to grow in order to move forward in in order to progress um, we must have a vibrant culture and that will not happen if we are isolationist and we're a vibrant culture, largely because of the immigrants that have come in. I mean, we are... We're all immigrants. We are, we're all <laughs> immigrants. <laughs> we are all immigrants. And we kicked off the... Kick people who Not actually are largely <laughs> largely considered indigenous to this right. country. You know, we killed them. We massacred them. This is outrageous. You know? I, yeah, n nobody, nobody in this country, nobody in the state can... You know, can can say that we we ha aren't a nation of immigrants. <laughs> exactly. You know? We are a nation of immigrants, for sure. Go ahead, Cliff. <laughs> yeah, no, I was I was just gonna say, you know, because the it's it's interesting because the the very people that th the discussion has been shaped around as being called immigrants, you know, Latino uh, community, you know, is, is the only group that can really say that they're not the immigrants, <laughs> you know, because they were already here. See, that that's that's a <laughs> very very good point. Exactly, right. that's true. Yeah. But uh, uh, just speaking about the wall, you know, just reminds me of you know some people may have seen the. The president of Mexico's tweet saying, "Okay, you know, yeah, we'll pay for the wall if you throw in Mexico. I mean, if you throw in Texas, if you yeah, throw right. in Texas, <laughs> we'll take. Texas. Then we'll pay the wall. We'll, you know, how's That's that for an even swap?" So I, I just wanted to mention also, as far as walls are concerned, I've been fortunate to have been to a couple of the major walls in the world, like the Great Wall of China, mm -hmm. right? And then in the 1960s, when I was hitchhiking through um, Europe with one of my cousins, right, we went to East Berlin. Mm -hmm. We went across. Uh, Checkpoint Charlie into uh, through that wall into East Berlin, but some people will say it's not so much a matter of building a wall to keep people out, but to keep the people in. <laughs> you mm, know, there's right. something to be said. We could have more of a dialogue about that mm -hmm. at some point. Definitely. So you know, we've got a, just a, a minute left uh, before we bring on our, our other guests to talk about the the Tuesday. Um, demonstrations, but real quick, well, one, if you want to finish up your thoughts, because you were talking about the, the the campus sanctuary, right? And and uh, I actually did want to just jump to to a, almost a companion <laughs> bill to sure, that, sure. Uh, and just let your listeners know about this. So that that sanctuary campus bill is uh, HB thirty seven, I believe, and HB fifty one, sponsored by the exact same state representative, is what we call the campus rape cover up bill. Mm -hmm. And I know we don't have too much time to discuss right. it, but that's another just horrendous bill mm -hmm. that would uh, essentially limit colleges and universities from taking disciplinary action mm -hmm. on people accused of uh, sexual assault on campuses. It makes, it is one of the most heinous pieces of legislation like that who, is... Who does that? Like, who who wakes up one morning and say, you know what, I got an idea for a bill. Let, let's do a bill that lets he, you cover up campus he, rape. He sure thinks it's justified. Who wakes up with that thought? Earl Earhart. <laughs> Earl, hey, there you go. That's the answer. That's the answer. So, so I, I encourage your listeners to keep an eye on that one too. There's, there's a few bills just like that one that are that we're going to be talking about that you'll hear other groups talk about mm -hmm. that we definitely need to stop this year, and that's one of them. We're going to take a quick break, and mm -hmm. then we'll come back with our guests to talk about what's happening in the demonstrations at Senator Purdue's office. So, yep. stay tuned. We're back, and we're now joined by Caroline Stover, who's a concerned citizen, concerned uh, Georgia resident, who's 
been very active with helping to organize some Tuesday rallies at the offices of Senator Purdue. Yes, we um, have. And so let me just say hello to Caroline. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> glad you could make it. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. And so just start by telling us, you know, how did you get involved in this and what is it that you're all doing? Well, the how is a very recent story, actually. Uh, I am so inexperienced, really, with politics and, and organizing. And I actually think that that is part of the reason why these rallies that I have organized have been so successful because, you know, sometimes when you don't know anything about something, mm -hmm. then everything is possible. So mm -hmm. I kind of went into it with that mind view when I was getting a lot of emails about, obviously, lots of political issues mm -hmm. coming up recently. And one of the emails said, Tuesday rallies at your senator's office. You, do you want to organize one? And I thought how interesting it would be to go to my senator's office and talk to him and have a lot of people, like-minded people also talking. That first rally, uh, I mean, I literally thought we would be up there in the office, 10 people talking to the senator. There were uh, close to 100 people who mm. signed up for that rally. So we rallied outside. We had some other people who went up to the office talking to Senator Purdue's staff, and it it's continued from there. Tomorrow, we do it every Tuesday, tomorrow is our week four of these rallies, and we're really proud that we've had upwards of 200 people at some of our rallies. And it just has shown me that I'm not the only one out there with questions, and that's really what this this is all about. Let's talk about that for a second, because I, I do want to get to the details about tomorrow and, and how folks can plug in. But you know, just I just I'm because I'm so intrigued, and Heather and I have talked about this about the numbers of people who are getting involved, and not just showing up to rallies, but who are starting to plan, who take the lead on rally, and folks who have never done rally, protests, anything exactly. of the sort. So tell me, what was it, so you're getting these emails, what was the, the driving, because there's so many issues. We just talked about a whole bunch at the state level, there's a whole bunch at the federal level. Sure. What's, what was your motivating, what was the thing that, that, that most made you say, I have got to get involved in this and help to organize this? Confusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frankly, I mean, you know, I could go through a very long list of, of specific issues. Would love to be talking to Senator Perdue directly right now about passing a law requiring the Treasury to release the President's tax returns, and mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm alone with that, or to get behind, an, you know, a commission to investigate Russian meddling in the U.S. election. There are so many specifics, mm -hmm. But um, when we gather, when we rally, and when we meet with Senator Perdue's uh, staffers in their office, we are trying not to get into such a long laundry list. Mm -hmm. We really are trying to focus on one thing. We want to speak to Senator Perdue. Mm -hmm. We would like to speak directly to our elected official. We understand he's a U.S. senator. He's not, you know, our mm -hmm. state senator. We are asking him if... He is coming back to Georgia during the congressional recess. Mm -hmm. We would like to meet with him. And we have actually been given the answer no mm. for the last four weeks. Mm. No, he is not coming to Georgia. No, he will not be holding a town hall meeting. And so we really have distilled our request down to that one request. What does that mean, no, he's not coming back to Georgia? Like, he's just... In exile? Like, what, he's just going to stay in D.C.? I mean, I don't, what he's is, busy. He's busy. We have literally had those conversations with Purdue sa staffers, and I'm talking about his state policy director. Mm -hmm. She has told us that Senator Purdue has been asked, as I guess most senators or, you know, lawmakers in D.C., to stay in Washington for the first 100 days of Trump's presidency. The president has asked them to do that. And our response is... He can give us one day out of those 100 days. Mm -hmm. His constituents are asking for one day mm -hmm. where Senator Perdue will be here. Um, we need him. Mm -hmm. There, uh, and, you know, again, this is nonpartisan. We are completely looking at this as a coalition of citizens in Georgia. Mm -hmm. We love our state. We love our country. I think we're all agreed on many things mm -hmm. about our patriotism, our love of our country. We want it to be safe. We want it to grow. We want to keep America great. But we want. We also have questions. It's interesting, you know, that you say that Trump asked them to stay in D.C. for the first hundred days because clearly, not all of them are doing that, right? And and you know, you may have seen, you know, the the, the stories and the videos of, of Mitch McConnell, who like like Purdue, I guess, was trying to duck and dodge <laughs> some of his constituents, and so they decided, 
well, let's follow him to his house. Let's go to his house, you know. So right. he wasn't in DC for the <laughs> for the four hundred days. I really, I kind of doubt, you know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not stalking him or anything, but I really kind of doubt that Senator Purdue is actually staying in DC for a hundred days. But, but be that as it may, so you all strategy has been to hold these weekly rallies. Tell us Correct. about the rallies Correct. and tell us about the one taking place tomorrow. Well, tomorrow, as everyone knows, of course, it's Valentine's Day. It is going to be a little bit different just because it's Valentine's Day, mm-hmm. but really. Really, the rallies are the same. Um, again, this is just the fourth one that we've had, mm-hmm. and you know we've pretty much had the same kind of rallies where people come with their signs. We peacefully um, gather. Mm-hmm. We really don't see ourselves as protesters. This is not an aggressive, mm-hmm. angry crowd. Mm-hmm. We are out there to uh, have our voices heard, and that's what we do. We're, we're very peaceful. We're very aware that we're on a, in a public place. We stand on the sidewalk in front of 191. On Peachtree Street, which is uh, where his local office is. Mm. And um, we usually have wonderful people speaking to us on the megaphone who are s- talking about the environment. We have the Sierra Club. We have the New Georgia Project, which heads up voting rights uh, here. And we also are trying to focus on community and civic leaders. Tomorrow we'll have Reverend Michael Wortham from Ebenezer Baptist Church coming to speak to us. We also have um, a sort of pass the megaphone kind of ritual where anyone can speak. We have people coming up, you know, who are ralliers, and they come to the megaphone also, and we talk to each other. People like (laughs) Heather. I hope Heather will be there tomorrow. We'd love to have her. And, you know, we really we really are um, citizens um, expressing ourselves mm-hmm. and hoping that our, that our senator is out there realizing that we want to have a conversation. So you mentioned that tomorrow's Valentine's Day. So how does uh, yes. that play into your, your theme of tomorrow's activities? One of, our, one of our ralliers, her name is Amy. She had a wonderful idea. Amy is a two-time cancer survivor, and she emailed me one day and said, you know, for our Valentine's Day rally, wouldn't it be great if we focused on things we love? And Amy already created a Valentine for the Affordable Care Act. She literally made a Valentine Mm. that is to the Affordable Care Act. I love you. I'm so glad you're in my life. And that's what we're doing tomorrow. We are bringing Valentines to the rally. We're also going to have blank colored paper hearts that people can write on. And we will be walking up to Senator Perdue's office in groups of 10, maybe. That's about all that can fit into his little lobby. And we'll be delivering the Valentines of things that we love. The ACA, the EPA. My favorite is, Mm -hmm. um, I think Tom Ferguson is his name, the Washington Attorney General who Mm -hmm. got behind Mm -hmm. the the recent... um, the ban. Judicial, yes, mm-hmm. that that whole incident. And, uh, you know, I think that what he's doing is wonderful. I think there are so many things going on out there that we can appreciate, and that's really what we're about. We're about appreciating <laughs> and um, and holding dear to our hearts so many things that we don't want, you know, we, we want to protect. So you told us the location, 191 Peachtree. What's the time? The time is 1230, and it's always 1230. It's always at 191 Peachtree. Um, we usually go, I mean, sometimes we've been there until 2.30, and, you know, people can come as late or and, and leave as early as they want, but between 12.30 and 2.30, we're there. You know, again, we are uh, tomorrow, aside from Valentine's Day, I'll just quickly um, say that we are also focusing on something else that we find disturbing. Over the weekend, I think there were a lot of town hall meetings that we all saw on TV. There was one in Greensboro. And Senator Perdue's, a spokesperson of Senator Perdue's, this was in the AGC over the weekend, said that, that uh, use the word manufactured, that we, that we, meaning protesters who are out there, have manufactured these protests. Mm-hmm. And I can't speak for anyone who was at that town hall meeting, which, by the way, was not attended by any of the senators. These are meetings that are attended by their regional reps, and I'm finding that to be also a narrative that is possibly misleading for many people. You know, Mm -hmm. come to a Purdue town hall meeting. We're having three of them in February, but Purdue's not at any of those Mm -hmm. meetings. Mm -hmm. It's team Purdue. That means his team is there. Mm -hmm. So, again, Senator Purdue is not there. Uh, Senator Purdue's staff, um, we think, is condescending to to the fact that we want to speak to our our elected officials by saying that we're manufacturing protests. And I think that um, you know that is something that will probably keep us out there for many weeks to come. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is that is that sort of like uh, 
what is this like fake news or alter? I mean, there are all these new things that are coming mm-hmm. out of manufacturing. Exactly. Right. Uh, Nothing's real anymore. So what we want to do here at Just Peace is to uh, continually get updates while you all are having these demonstrations. Okay. We would love that. I need to mention it's very impressive what we've seen in Atlanta the past uh, month. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, at the airport, the women's mm-hmm. march, the uh, march for the sanctuary city on an, on the day, the inauguration day. Yes. But at the uh, airport, one of my favorite favorite posters was uh, "Rednecks Against Xenophobia." I mm-hmm. love that. I needed to mention that to everyone. <laughs> That could be very that articulate. Rednecks against xenophobia, and it was a redneck holding it, so that's a good thing, right? So that could be your Valentine card. <laughs> my va- yes, my Valentine <laughs> card. Right. I, we want to thank you so much for coming in, and we look forward to hearing more about what's happening at, at Purdue's office. Thanks for the thank great work. Thank you so much. Go ahead. And I just want to remind people that we have the latest press release um, from Caroline's group. It's on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash just peace WRFG. Uh, just Peace, WRFG, and you can find all that information there. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so happy to be here. Thank you.